Nate's come out with another awesome tool for the swimming community. It's called Swim Nerd Live, and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart TV, phone, or other device. It has all the information you're looking for, event, heat, lane, name of swimmer, times and places. One click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time. Go to swimpractice.com to learn more. Okay, Lilia Banyas, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Brett, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here in the podcast with you. Your background looks amazing, better than mine, but uh, I'm really good. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Where are you coming from right now? I'm in Mexico City right now. Mexico City. And, and what's yeah. it like in Mexico City right now? What are the conditions like as we speak in, in January? It's really, really tough, Brett. Like, it's... Uh, I mean, in the whole world is tough, but here in Mexico City, I think we're about to hit uh, full hospitality uh, condition. Like we, we don't have any more beds, any more oxygen, no more ventilator. Like people, people is having a hard time. Like uh, in, in, in the whole country is tough, but, but in Mexico City, it's like really, really bad. Like people are not, well, we're trying to not go out of, home and everything but we have to go out you know but when i go out i literally go out with a mask like a for fertilization and a big helmet like i i don't touch anything uh, it's it's really hard here now listen for full disclosure you and i have been actually working together for a while now um i've been uh kind of coaching you i guess uh in in the new form of coaching and that's kind of um online coaching really you know we talk to each i send you workouts uh every week you know we talk to each other on whatsapp you'll send me training videos you'll send me training results um but we've had uh you know this formal relationship now for um, it's it's been over a year now right it's over a year yeah like a year and a half almost wow you took me right after my shoulder surgery mm. and uh from there we started with three months of kicking workouts only That's right. it was only like underwater is kicking with my shoulder at my side and then from there i started swimming but it was it was tough at the beginning like thank you thank you for taking me like that because not not anybody would have done that well, that's interesting. Why did you decide to reach out to me in the first place in terms of looking for a, a new coach and, and why did you want to continue after shoulder surgery? Because I wanted to sprint. Uh, technically, that's, that's the answer. I wanted to, to swim 1500 freestyle. Uh, my whole career, I've been training for 1500, 200 freestyle, sometimes 400, uh, 1500 fly. And then after 2018, when I swam nine events at the Central American Games, which meant like I swam 18 times because it was prelims and finals, my body was destroyed. And I was, okay, I'm done with this. Like I'm done swimming everything, you know, and the relays, like it was just too much for my body. So I was like, okay, I'm, I, I was 28 at the time. I was like, I need to focus. I need to focus in one or two things which is what the world's doing you know yeah and and that's what i'm going to do and if i have to pick any event in the entire world since i'm little i will have picked the 53 and i also like the 100 free and i'm good at it you know because with a 200 background i can finish the 100 so i was like okay 1500 free and in mexico i was asked to pick a coach in the world and i was up uh, red hawk like I, I did, I did not have to think two minutes that answer. <laughs> well, I, I hope I've lived up to your expectations and I, I look, I, I know, I know we have, like we, we have a great relationship. Look, the thing I love about you is you're a hard worker. You say, coach, tell me what to do and I'll do it. And you do, uh, you don't just talk about it. You actually put those things into action and you're so positive. You have such a positive outlook. For somebody that's been in the sport for a while now, you know, you're, you, you grew up in Mexico, you came to the US and 
and swam in college at Texas A&M. Uh, you've gone on to represent your country at many different levels, you know, all the way up to the Olympic Games. Um, and you've just remained so positive. You're such a positive force and, and you've had your setbacks and we can talk about a few of those, but uh, just in terms of your own personal mantra, your own mindset and, and the way you approach athletics and life, what is that for you? You know, because I love what I do. I literally love swimming. Every time you send a practice, I'm the night before checking it, thinking what I can do good, what I can do the best, what I have to work in. I, I always think, in, you know, we've had trouble in kicking. This is not, you know, like, this is something I've been working on a year and a half. Uh, and finally, you can say I'm becoming a better kicker, you know, like I, I'm, I'm kicking faster. I feel my legs faster. I feel like they are actually helping me to swim. I've always been a big puller, you know, like I, I, I almost pull as fast as I swim. And, and now that I have my kicking helping me, it's been a big thing for me. And when we started working together, you told me you need to kick, you know? So, so that has been my goal. And every day, every night before I check the practice and I say like, okay, where's the kick set? You know, where's, where's, in what part of the practice I'm going to focus on the kick? And then in this part, I'm going to focus in the pool. And then in this part is tough. It's going to be only like kind of survival, but, but focus, make it an intention. Don't only like just swim through it, you know, like have an intention for every practice. And, and I think that's the way it's, it's worked uh, my whole life because I really enjoy this. Like, I have a master's degree and I have a, an undergrad in urban planning and I, and I could be working uh, and making money, you know, but uh, I love this uh, and I love uh, swimming. I love training and uh, it's just like a dream. And then getting paid for what you love is I wouldn't change it. It's kind of the universal theme really with, with swimmers at your level is, um, you know, once you get to a certain age, once you get past college, you're doing it because you really love swimming, you're passionate about it. But there's also a process of, of relearning and improving. It, it really never ends in terms of how good you could possibly be and how much improvement you could make. Uh, you're, never, you're never good enough. You can always find ways to improve. And that, that's one of the things I love about you. You're always digging for those little bits of improvement. Um, just in terms of where you started swimming, where, where did that happen for you? It started in Celaya, which is a little town in uh, central Mexico in the state of Guanajuato. Uh, I started in the same pool of the kindergarten I went to. I started at two years old. So I've been swimming for now 28 years. It's been like a whole long road, you know? And from there, I just grew up in that same pool I was until I was in high school. Then I changed to a club team where they took uh, swimming a little bit more seriously, you know, more competitive. And I stayed there until I was 18 uh, when Steve Bullman uh, met me in Rome and um, where I met you too. And he recruited me and then I went to Texas a and but my, my entire life I was in Celaya. Wow. That's really a dream come true for, for someone from Mexico because, look, you, you don't have the same support system. And, I, and I'm not saying that you're not supported because you certainly are. Um, but, it, but it's different. It's, it's tough. And for you to grow up dreaming about swimming, did you have dreams of possibly swimming in America? Like when Steve Boltman approached you on the deck, was this like a dream come true for you? It was actually not at the moment because I didn't knew what I was saying not to. I actually told him no at the beginning. You oh, know, wow. like I, I, I was um, in the state of Mexico where I'm from. We're very family oriented. You uh -huh. know, like I, I'm an only child, so I was like stick to my mom. Like my mom didn't leave me any time of the day unless I was swimming or in school. Mm -hmm. So when he came to recruit me, I was like, I have to leave home. Like that, that was something really tough for me. Uh, I took the recruiting trip and that was a change in my life. When I actually saw the pool, the, the 50 meter pool, when I saw that they gave chocolate milk after practice, it was that chocolate milk that totally took me 
took my attention, took my, I was like, wow, you get chocolate milk and you also get free dinner? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and it was like steak, you know, like in Mexico, I always, uh, when I was home, I, I usually ate like chicken soup for dinner. I mean, I don't say, like right now we're supported, you know, like mm -hmm. like Mexico has helped us to, to reach this goal and we've had support. But when I was a child and when I was growing up and all the way until I left Texas A&M, and even my first part in Texas A&M, I had zero support. Like it was, it was almost none. It was really hard. Like my parents come from a, a like we, we're a working family, you know, like sure. a middle income family for Mexico, which is, I mean, the minimum to put it in 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 words, the minimum wage in Mexico is like three dollars, three fifty. I mean, it, no no person in the U.S. can live with that, you know, like. Yeah. In Mexico, it's really tough to do a sport uh, as as a hobby almost because when you're a child, you you either are really good in the nationals, where are the Olimpiada Nacional, to get a support, to get a stipend, to get a monthly payment, or you'll soon have to pick between you go to school and you try to live from work, or you keep swimming and you get poor. So it's it's. It's been really hard, um, the athlete life, you know? And now, now um, we have a difference. Like now I'm having help. I'm having uh, that push, you know, from the, from the Ministry of Sports, like we've been helped. And, and this has really, to me, pushed me to try to, to reach for more, to keep learning. Yes, you're right. And, uh, it's amazing to see how far you've come really. It's an incredible story and it's one of inspiration. Um, I think that you're a role model for a lot of young uh, women in, in Mexico for sure, but also athletes, you know, you're just, uh, you persevere and I love that about you and, and you don't, you fight the odds, you know, you beat the odds and, and that's a great, great story for life, you know, but uh, tell me this, what, what was your first Olympic memory experience, like watching the Olympics or, or dreaming of the Olympics? You know, uh, you know, all, most of the kids grow up thinking, I want to go to the Olympics, you know, or watching the Olympics in the TV. Uh, I remember watching Ian Thorpe mm -hmm. in Athens. That's something, uh, no, in Sydney. That's something that really changed my life. Like watching this big guy in the big black suit beating everyone, the world, like, you know, like shut down for him. That was amazing. How old were you when you when you were watching the Sydney Olympics then? So that was, I like was 21 years ago. It was ago. in 2000. I was like nine years. Yeah, eight years, yeah. Eight, eight or nine years old. Yeah. Yeah, I I was really young, I, and it, that that totally like shut my head down. But but I never say like I want to be there. You know, I I that that was not something that happened through my through my head because I was going to practice because it was part of my routine because I loved it because, but I, I didn't knew what was the steps to get to an Olympic games. I didn't know that you have to go to Central American games, then to Pan American games, then to try to get a cut. I didn't knew that there was a cut until uh, it was 2006 when I went to my first Central American games in the, in the senior group, I was 15 and then then I, I learned what I had to do to make the Olympics. Then I knew I could actually make the Olympics because everyone was talking about the Pan American Games and everyone was talking that after the Pan American Games, you make the Olympics. So that's when my head was like, oh, okay, I'm in the road to the Olympics, you know? But, but when I saw Thorpe, I, I just saw it as a dream, you know? I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's amazing. And then it became like a kind of truth. What about this dream that you, you start to talk to your parents about, you know, possibly going to America and pursuing this dream? Is this, you're, you're an only child. Is this, uh, was this yeah. difficult for them to understand and, and let you go? 
Yeah, my mom said no. <laughs> my mom said you cannot go. You're not ready. You're going to die. You don't know how to heat water up. You, I, I never used an alarm in Mexico. You know, I didn't know how to wake up on my own. She was like, you're going to get kicked out in the first month. Don't even try. <laughs> like she was like, look for a university in Mexico. Even if you want to go north to to Monterey, which is uh, the Monterey Tech, it's a uh, it's very well known for good education and they also kind of support uh, sports. So that was like my dream when I was little to go to the Monterey Tech. But, um, but my mom said like, there's no way. And my dad say like, go, go. Like, this is something we will never be able to give you. This is a future that I'm not going to be able to give you. And when, when your father say that to you, you know, when, when the man that has worked his whole life that I almost done seeing the day because he has been working the entire day and then he suddenly says go like I don't want you here I want you to go because that's the best opportunity you will get and then your mom says you cannot go it, it was like a tough decision mm. you know but mm. my dad said I'll do the whole process with you he took me for my visa he took me to the airport for my recruiting trip and everything and the entire time, my mom was with a big face, like, who are you? There? You know, like, she was there the whole time, but she was really mad. And I believe they even talked to each other for, like, months for this thing, you know? I almost caused a divorce in the family. But, you know, four years after, when my mom and my dad didn't have a passport, they, my mom now has a passport. My dad has never had a passport. He never went to visit me to the U.S., but my mom did when I graduated from my undergrad. She got her passport for that. And when she got there and she saw me with my hat, with my super nice like uh, dressing of graduation, and she saw the degree, she was like, you know what? Thank God your dad said yes, because I don't regret this. You've become the swimmer you want to be. You've become the student you want to be and the person I never think you were going to become if you stayed with me. So after my mom was like, you had to do that. But in the moment, you know, like, she, I don't think she talked to me for the first weeks. And then after that, we were all crying the phone, like, I miss you, I miss you. But but at the beginning, it was really tough. It was yeah. really tough. I love that story. It's it's pure, it's real. And, um, you know, the, the thing is, you, I love coaching athletes like you in, in college as well, because you're so appreciative of everything you get yeah. and every, every opportunity that's put in front of you. Where do you think, um, you know, what's your advice to, to young Americans who, who don't really understand what they're getting? Uh, did that frustrate you, at, frustrate you at times where you're on the team and you're so appreciative, but some of the teammates around you just don't understand how lucky they are? You know what was tough for me, Fred? It's a. Uh, it took me a while to understand it, and to accept it, and to say, it's the cool. It's okay, you know. This is how things work here. When you went to the showers, and the showers were open for thirty minutes straight, you know, like when when people shower with the with the open water the whole time, and don't close it because in Mexico there's parts of Mexico that don't have water to drink. And in my town, they they turn off the water after 6 p.m. So you cannot shower after 6 p.m. Wow. So when I got there and I saw the showers like, you know, like on for 30 minutes, I remember I was just like, like someone could drink this, you know, like it took me a while because I turned on the shower and then I, I, I get wet and I turn it off to get all the shampoo and everything. And then I, I turn it on again. Uh, it was really hard for me. I, I promise you, to me, that was part of the culture that I was like, this is hard. Like, you know, like, it's hard to accept it. But then I got used to it. And sometimes I also take longer showers, not not too long, you know, but I started taking a little longer showers. But but it, it's part of living in two different worlds because we've, we've driven from San Diego to Tijuana, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that's 20 minutes apart and it's two different worlds two like different in, worlds. One, in one part there's like million dollar houses with pools people that work if, if you're working anywhere the minimum wage will get you through a living 
in Mexico, there's people asking you for money in the corner, you know, like with their children begging. The children, you remember yeah. in the in the border, yeah, and on the border. These people that you say, like, how how do they go through, you know? Mm-hmm. And and it's it was really hard that part for me, the, the cult- cultural change and also uh the food, the court the food court was amazing. They had steak the whole time. They had all this good food. So what I will say to to the kids in America that are 17 and 18 and are, are willing to go to these universities that have everything, honestly have everything, mm-hmm. is uh, just look into internet. What is it to live in a developing country or in a third world country? And how are the pools, you know, like sometimes people don't have pools, sometimes people don't have water to it. So just just be appreciative, you know, like just know that uh, the U.S. is a blessed country is is the I, I truly believe is the land of the free, the home of the brave, because I, I've lived it, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, I when I uh, when I grew up there, it, it's an amazing place to grow up and, and just know that. Not everyone in the world has what you have. Well, listen, uh, I, I love that about your story. And I love that you're aware, your awareness of, of things like that. And that's why I love working with you, because you truly are so appreciative of things. And it's such a blessing to work with athletes that have that mindset, because it's like, like I said, it's like, tell me what to do, coach, and I'll do it. And yeah. that's where that's where you can have growth. That's where you can have success. And it's not so it's not to say that you don't question things. You know, you're an intelligent woman. Like you said, you have a master's degree, you're a, a free thinking woman. But it's it's about um, putting in the work that's necessary and being appreciative of the work and that's being done. And, and um, so I, I like it. But listen, in terms of when you finally made the Olympics in 2012, what was that experience like for you? It was, 2012 was a dream. I don't know if it was a nightmare and then a dream because I actually had an accident in October of 2011. Uh, I had an accident in my bicycle and I broke three vertebrates. Mm. So I fractured my, my back and I wasn't able to train until February of 2012. Uh, for that time, the cut I had the closest was the 203, which I was a uh, 201, uh, me 2013, 2014 was, was my best time. And the time to qualify or to get an invitation to the Olympics had to be under two, two minutes five, you know, two mm-hmm. minutes point four, two minutes point five. And, yeah. you know, with a broken back, I couldn't train, I couldn't lift weights, I, I couldn't do anything. So Steve, Steve, one day after I was able to go to rehab and everything, he saw me crying and he said, like, you know, like, if you're still willing to do it, I'm still willing to train you, you know, like, let, let's try it up. And I remember, I will never forget that day because he went to the pool with me by myself. There was no one else in the pool and he put me in the lane all the way in the side, you know, because he didn't know if I was going to drown or not after all these months and after the injury. And I remember I did the first 200 and he goes to the stairs and he goes like, Billy, you look great. It looks like you never stopped swimming. And this was a big part because I did a lot of visualization while I was injured. Uh, He made me go to a psychologist, to a sports psychologist, because he saw me so broken, you know, after... Mm. The, the injury he knew I wanted to do the Olympics. I, I, I thought my career was over after the fractures. And he, I, I used to go to see the practice of the girls, but just sitting down in a chair, like to see the whole practice sitting mm. down in a chair, to see most of the times the whole weight session sitting down on a chair. So that helped me to, you know, like they, they finished a hard set and they were like all tired. And I was like, I know what, what they are feeling. I know what they are doing, what their body is going through. And I think all that stuff helped me to, to keep in shape kind of the mind. Mm. So when I went to the water, I was like, I feel great. I've been watching this for the whole time. And, and when he saw me and he said like, you look great, we're going to do it. I was like, yeah, what do we need to do, coach? Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll do whatever you say. So I, I usually was in 
between the sprint group and the mid distance group. Sometimes in the distance group when I was at Texas A&M. Yeah. Uh, Mondays, Fridays in the distance group, Tuesdays, Thursdays in the sprint group, and in the mornings mid distance usually. Saturdays I was like doing half of the set of, of the sprint group, half of the set of the mid distance group. So some 200s, but also some hundreds and some fifties. So he told me like, we cannot do any more spring group because you are not allowed to do any, any weight because of my back. So I was not allowed to, to touch a weight for a year. And he said, we have, to, we have to bet for the 200 because that's the event that you can actually swim and swim and swim and swim and yeah. make it. We did that uh, until June, from February to June. I don't know how great. My best time before the injury was 201. In June in Santa Clara, I went at 20036, which is still the national record in Mexico. I don't know how I dropped a second after I didn't swim for four months, after I had a broken back. I was not training weights. I was only swimming and I qualified there to the Olympics. It, it, I cried after that. Like, I uh, that like, sounds like a, an experience Sergio Lopez uh, told me. Actually, Sergio Lopez had a very similar experience where he broke his uh, his um, clavicle, I believe, his shoulder, uh -huh. and um, and he did a lot of visualization. And then after you know the doctors told him that he, he couldn't swim basically, and he came back and ended up uh, you know swimming a time that was top three or four in the world. You know, so it, yeah, the, the visualization is a very powerful tool, huh? It's incredible. By the way, hi, Sergio. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good man. No, it's it's a big tool, Brett. And, and before that, I, you know, we always had on Wednesday our psychology sessions of, okay, uh, lean, in the, lean in the room, close your eyes. And we all, I usually was, you know, like my head was somewhere else, like not mm -hmm. visualized. After mm -hmm. that, Brett, I took visualization more seriously than anything in my life mm. in my life like before i do something i always am thinking how i'm going to do it i, I do it in my head before i do it actually in the water you know yeah. or i uh, before i do it in life like before the podcast like i was already you know like thinking all the things that we've been through like possible questions like that's how i do it also like I used to do it in school. I, I, I do it in, in my entire life. And that, that has helped me a lot to be conscious, you know, because sometimes we, we live unconscious and we just live, you know. And, and when you think before you live, you can take better decisions. Yeah, great advice. I like that a lot and very powerful tool as well. Um, so, well, tell me about this. Let, let's talk about what you like about my programs. I haven't really had anyone on here that's really dug into the things you like doing now with me and the things that, that I, that I feel like work for sprinting. What are some of the things that you've noticed that you're like, wow, I've never done that before, or that's really interesting or something that's really connected with you. Do you know what I love, Brett? I love that you kill me every day. <laughs> you kill me in some way. It can be a thousand years. It can be a 6,000. I always end up like I can walk after practice because if it's a, we've done a 300 of practice, which is 300s all out, you know, and, and that kills me. And we've done aerobic sets with where I think in any kind of practice, if you put an intention, like you, you'll die. You can die. You can make it easy and cheat on it, or you can make it as it is. I love, I really love that because you push my limits every single day. It can be mentally, it can be also you've done boring practices and you said like this practice is meant for you to not make it, like to not make the intervals. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to do that, you know? And, and I'm like, I used to, I think I've admired you since I'm little because uh, coming from a Latin American country, being a sprinter, it's kind of a, it's kind of a rule that you have to know who Cesar Cielo is, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and Cesar, since I was little, was like someone that I look up to and, and not just me. Like, I know he's, he's an idol in Latin America, you know? Like, the, one of the only Latin Americans to, to be in the sprint as a medalist. And I always wonder, like, what does he train? What 
what does he do to be who he is? And now I know, you know, like, like you just kill your swimmers every single day in, intelligently. That's, that's the, the world I will use the description. Smartly killing. You know, <laughs> well, because that's the thing. Look, there's no way around hard work. You've got to, exactly. you've got to work hard. And, exactly. and, um, you know, you know, in fairness to full disclosure and what you're doing, we, we only swim once a day right now, you know? So yeah. it's like you get a full 24 hours to recover. And during that recovery time, you're doing things. I mean, you're taking, um, you know, uh, cold, cold tubs. I see you do a lot of cold yeah. tub work. You get massage physiotherapy, you know, you're doing things, but in terms of what we do in the pool, it's basically once a day go in and you got to work hard. I mean, there's just no way around it, but it's an intelligent, yeah. like you said, it's an intelligent type of very specific work that relates to what you're trying to do in your races. Exactly. And I think you work every single part of the race. You work the start, you work the turn, you work the finish, and there's a specific parts of the practice that you do it. But I also love what we've talked about, like you can make me do turns after practice, but if you do 250 turns in every practice, mm -hmm. like you don't do them well, you don't have to stay after practice to do turns, you know? Like, yeah. like I, I like that of, um, you've shared to me or you kind of taught me to give my everything and my best in every practice. Because if I train once a day, honestly, I can give my best two hours of the day. You know, I can give my soul two hours of my day. Then I can eat, I can sleep. I'll, I have the whole day, you know, I do weights and stuff like that. But but in the war, it's just two hours. So, so I don't have any excuse to not give you my very best. One of the things that has been a challenge, I have to tell you, is that the, the, every time we do breath exercise, breath work, it's been tough. You're, you're a tough man, Brett. Like, mm. sometimes we take the whole air out and we have to swim fast like that. Mm. That is something that has really challenged me. That's something that has made me learn ways to say, okay, I don't need air. You know, I don't need to breathe. Like, I... I I have to find the air that I still have in my arms, in my legs, and pull it to my lungs because I'm not allowed to give up breath in this mm -hmm. 50. So, so you've challenged me in many different ways, and, and I appreciate every one of them because, you know, we're doing this for a goal, which is called Tokyo, but honestly, every single day I win. Like, regardless what happens in Tokyo, Every single day I win when I go in the water loving it and when I finish dead and I say, you know what? I gave my best. That's, that's my winning. Well, I love hearing you say that because it's so applicable to the end result as well. Is like at the end, you want to look back and say, I did everything I could, you know? Yeah. I, I tell this, uh, this very um, interesting story about myself that at the end of the Athens Olympics, uh, the Australian swim team, um, chartered a plane back from Athens back to Australia and only the Australian um, athletes were allowed on this chartered plane and all the Olympic gold, the way they split the plane up was Olympic gold medalists in first class, business class was silver medalists, um, like economy comfort was the bronze medalist. And then in the, the back of the plane was everybody that didn't win a medal. So I was one of the ones at the back of the plane, obviously. And uh, one of the air hostesses, she said to me, how'd you do at the Olympics? And I said, I finished six. And she said, Oh, I'm so sorry. That was her response to me. And I was like, why are you sorry? Like I gave it, I gave it. I just finished six in the whole world. There's only five people in the whole world that beat me. Like, what are you sorry for? I was like, I had an amazing experience. And that's, that's kind of been my mentality to training now is like, just leave it all in the pool. And then you have no regrets. You have no excuses. Like I got beat by five guys that were better than me. I'm okay with that. You know, um, I can live with totally that for the rest great. of my life. And, and that's totally. kind of the attitude that you adopt too. And, and I love that. Um, one of the other things that you just mentioned there too, was, um, was, was the breath itself. Um, what was I going to say about that? It's very interesting. Oh, that's right. In the 50 freestyle, I remember as an athlete, I always used to think to myself, well, where am I going to take my breath? And then over, over years of training, I realized I swam faster when I didn't breathe, you know, from start to finish. 
Well, then I had to assess, well, when do I actually take that last breath? And for me, it was when the whistle would go off. You know, they blow the whistle for you to stand up on the blocks. And then right before, in between the whistle and take your marks, I would take a deep breath. And then I would exhale and relax my body. And so there was a moment between take your marks and the gun going off. I'd already started to hold my breath. And then I had to perform at the highest level I've ever performed at. I had to keep my stroke length. I had to keep my stroke tempo. I had to maintain my speed for 22 seconds. So, so to do that and to think of when I took my last breath was probably somewhere about 27, 28 seconds before that. And then you're performing at full speed. So what I always say to you is like, you better learn to be comfortable without any oxygen yeah. swimming as fast as you possibly can. And that's, that's why we do those things. And I, and I love it because that's true, you know, like I also do that. I, I stay a little bit high in the block, take mm -hmm. my breath and then go down with that breath in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I usually breathe once in the 50, but the goal now is to not breathe, you know? So, so I'm feeling it in practice. Everything I've ever felt in any meet, I felt it in practice with you. Every, all the pain, all yeah. the lack of breath, all the desperation, because I mean, thinking without oxygen in your brain is all so hard, you know? So you yeah. have to kind of know where the right arm goes because you you, all, you already have it memorized kind of. And, and every single thing I've experienced in, in your practices. So I'm really grateful for that. Right? And I was going to tell you something about uh, what, the, what, what you experience in the plane. Um, mm. You know... After we've had two surgeries, we've had a, soldier, a shoulder surgery mm -hmm. and a knee surgery. Mm -hmm. The last one was in October of last year. I'm not going to win the Olympics, you know, yep. but we're training to make history still because we are doing something that has never been done in this country, that has never been done in Mexico. You know, I hold the national record for 15 years in the 53, mm. 15 years. And when I broke it for the first time, there was no, I didn't knew an Olympian that swam the 53 in the Olympics. You know, like there was not somebody to look at. There, there was no somebody that I was like, oh, I want to be like that Mexican. Yes. You know, yes. I, I would mean like, I want to be like Cesar Cielo. I want to be like Ian Thorpe, but mm -hmm. there's no Mexican. Mexican that I say like I want to be like that yes we're not training to win gold in the Olympics right now after the two surgeries but we're still dreaming on making history mm -hmm. and doing something that has never been done in this country because there's kids there's young people here that have the talent but they don't know it can be done yes what we want to do is to show them it can be done Mm -hmm. you know and we believe we can so so i mean i i love you finishing six and i admire you as a swimmer i admire you as a coach and and i think winning the olympics is not the only way to win in the olympics yeah it's a beautiful message and it's so true because look at the end of the day there's only one person generally unless you're gary hall and anthony Irvin uh, for a tie generally there's only going to be one gold medalist there's going to be everybody else that goes to the Olympics is going to be pretty disappointed in that event, you know, because it's only going to be one that takes the gold. So look, if, if you if your expectation or if your, if your whole life depends on winning gold, you're probably going to be disappointed. So it, it can't be based around that. It's got to be something bigger than that. I love that message that you talk about is being an inspiration for, for Mexican athletes, for Mexican people, for Mexican young girls. You know, it's like having somebody they can say, that's who I want to be like. Yeah. Even if you finish 50th at the Olympic Games, you stand up behind the blocks, you have the Mexican flag on, you compete as hard as you can, you leave it all in the pool. I mean, that's inspiration right there. And that's what the Olympics ultimately is all about. It's why it was started. It's what it's founded on. And um, it's part of the Olympic dream. Um, you've been there and, and we're just trying to get there again. So in terms of um, the challenges that are ahead right now in the next few months, uh, they're pretty, they're pretty extensive uh, in terms of yeah. just getting to the Olympics. So tell us, what are we going to do here? Well, first we have to find a meet to make, try to make the cut to taper and to shave. We, yeah. we need to, we need to have meets, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that every country is getting out today. The USA got out their uh, 
the rules for their Olympic trials. Canada has already got theirs. In Mexico, we still don't have a meet. We don't know if we will have a meet. Maybe we won't have a meet where we can qualify to the Olympics. So we have to go out to find a meet somewhere else in another country. But almost every country is like, this is only for our athletes, you know? So for now, we don't have a meet where we can taper and shave. We were trying to go to Marseille, uh, but you need to do seven days of quarantine when you enter France. So, I mean, if we taper, we're training super hard and then we're in the hotel room for seven days, it's like a suicide, mm. you know, like yeah. it's, it's, it's impossible. So, I mean, the, the real challenge right now is, is not only to train and train hard, it's what are we training for? Yes. You know, where yeah. are we training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's what I look at. A lot of people ask me the question, are they going to have the Olympics? And I said, well, look, that's, that's a big challenge, but it's not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is how do you qualify for the Olympics? You know, yeah. uh, I understand the support that Americans have. And, I, and I've seen what, um, you know, England have done where they've nominated a, f a four athletes already. And, and I hope that Mexico might even adopt a, a similar policy, you know, just uh, Canada just did that and nominate some athletes before a trials or get, find opportunities for them to qualify because that's going to be the biggest challenge is, is just qualifying for the Olympics. And then, and then, yes, obviously, you know, putting this thing together and look, I, I hope the IOC comes out and just gives us some clarity on that. They said they're definitely yeah. doing it. Tell us how you're doing it. You know, that would be nice. Um, yeah. Right now. I know that's a difficult situation, you know, to, to, to think back even four months, to think where we are now, things have changed so much. So uh, there's, there's a lot going on, um, but athletes are very anxious and, and we need to find ways that we can, um, you know, help with the anxiety because look, athletes by nature are anxious anyway. You know, it's, it's, you put a lot of pressure on yourself and this is um, just accentuating that pressure, even more magnifying it. And so, uh, yeah, I hope we can get some clarity for, for us uh, in the near future. With these kind of big goals, you usually have a timeline. You know, that's the difference, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, you usually know, yeah. know what are you, when are you preparing for? A plan, and yeah, a plan. You, know, you have a plan. <laughs> for now, it's been a year since it's been moved, and we kind of know for when and where, but we're just like okay, let's hope there is something in March, April, you know, like, it, it's yeah. like, we're blind, we're just, yeah. yes. but, but you know what, in the meanwhile, th this part has been tough, but in the meanwhile, my biggest goal has been to become faster, yeah. because, yes, we want to go to Tokyo, but we want to swim in 24 seconds at 53, so having that goal, has allowed me to go to the pool, not thinking on, oh, I don't know when I'm going to race, but saying like, what's going to make me closer today to 24 seconds. So, so yeah. having like, not too much the outcome of the Olympics as a goal, but being faster as a goal every day has helped me a lot mentally because I would be like becoming crazy if I wasn't. Yeah. Well, look, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's going to happen. And I'll make this public for everybody to understand. This is what we're going to do. We're going to at some point put a suit on. We're going to at some point shave down and we're going to at some point give everything we've got to a swim, whether that's um, in an official time trial or it's unofficial. We're going to have some finality of our training to say we did everything we possibly could to get to the Olympic Games with with as much support as we can or, or no support, zero support. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to show young Mexican women that we didn't give up at any point. Right. You know, we're going to, we're going to put everything we can on the line. And if that means we're in Tokyo, amazing, brilliant. If it, if it doesn't, then you know what we, we at least can look back 10, 15, 20 years on, on our life from now and say at that point in time, when, the, when everything was against us, we still managed to produce something you know and so yeah. we're going to be proud of something you know i love it brett where do i sign up <laughs> well, you've already it. signed up unfortunately you're you're in <laughs> there's no way out <laughs> um no. listen i love like i said i love i love you i love your 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 um your energy i love your enthusiasm i love your uh, intention to want to be great at something. I love everything about that. And I wish there were more athletes like you. So um, hopefully a lot of people will take something from this interview. It's very inspirational and, um, and maybe you'll get a few more supporters and, and, and maybe some, some people that can help us in the next few months. So 
I uh, appreciate you being on the, the show, Lily. Thanks very much. Thank you, Brett, for having me. And thank you for being my coach. More than my coach, you're like a mentor, such a wise person, such a wise man. And you've really encouraged me to grow up because that's something you've always tell me. I don't have all the answers. And I love that because you encourage me to search, to look and to become a better person. So more than making me a better athlete, thank you for making me a better person. Yeah, absolutely. And look, look, in, in full credit and disclosure to, to Steve Boltman, he's done the same thing for you in your life. He's been a very big absolutely. influence. So you, you've had some good people. He's like a dad to me. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know that for a fact. And so I wanted to mention that he's been a big, big influence in your life and still continues to be. He's a great supporter. He's a good man. Great coach. He's done a lot for you and many other people. So uh, again, listen, thanks for being here and um, good luck at practice this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Brett. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.